can. But let's start on the talk. So first of all, I want you guys to know a little bit more about myself. So I started diving about eight years ago now while I was traveling and I just fell in love with the underwater world. It is just such a beautiful, calming experience to go on a dive. It's something you can't really explain until you actually go on it. It's, it's beautifully quiet and calm, but yet there's so much activity and so much life and it's just going on all around you and everywhere you look, there's, there's life in the water, there's life on the floor. You know, it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place to spend time. So needless to say, after I did that first dive, I just fell in love with the underwater world and wanted to spend all my time under there. So over the next five years, I took every opportunity I could to go traveling again and to do more diving around the world. And I was very lucky to uh, experience many, many shark encounters or sharks on my dives over those years, including, you know, from the very small or quite small epaulette shark, which is only about, about 50 centimeters long, maybe. Um, but I've also been lucky enough to, to swim with the largest shark and the largest fish in the world, the whale shark, which regularly grow up to about 16 meters long. Some people even have reported seeing 20 meter sharks. So they, they vary hugely and I've been lucky enough to see a, a wide variety of those sharks while I've been on my dives and my free dives. And so about three years ago, I decided that I was bored of constantly wanting to go traveling and wanting to get back out into the ocean. So I, um, three years ago, I, I left the UK and, and went into a career of marine conservation and diving. And over the last few years, I've worked as, as a scuba dive instructor, a free diver, um, a, a shark educator, an intern coordinator for a shark conservation organization. Um, and over the last year, I was actually lucky enough to be involved in some shark research. I was assisting on collecting the data. Uh, this research was actually, luckily it was my girlfriend's master's thesis that she was doing. And we were studying these amazing sharks that you see in the photo here, which are ragged tooth sharks. And we were monitoring the movements of these pregnant females that come up to the area where we were living um, in South Africa just for their pregnancy. So we were free diving with these amazing, beautiful pregnant ladies every day, trying to monitor their movement during their pregnancy, which was just an incredible experience. And we had about four months where we free dived with numerous sharks, up to sort of 70 sharks all around us um, on certain days. And we were, we were lucky enough to do that um, for research. And so during this time, I also was supervising the free dives because um, we had a number of different free divers diving down to collect photo identification shots. So, you know, like I said, I've, I fell in love with the underwater world eight years ago. And every time I dived and saw a shark, it was just such a unique and special experience that I just wanted to learn more about sharks. I wanted to spend more time with sharks and I wanted to to protect them when I learn more about them. So there are three main things that I want everyone here to take away from today's talk, okay? So the first thing is that I want everyone to understand that sharks are vital to the marine ecosystem. They're really, really important to our whole marine ecosystem. The other thing I want everyone to really come away with understanding is that they are not the monsters and these scary animals that everyone thinks they are or, or the general public think they are. And then finally, one of the biggest things that I want everyone to come away with today is that they are in urgent, urgent need of our protection and that you as an individual can do something to make a difference. So you can have an impact. Every single person on this call, you can have an impact through your actions. The worst thing that can happen is you go away thinking, oh, you know, I want to protect sharks, but just me doing something isn't going to make a difference, but everybody's individual actions add up to be huge, huge changes. And obviously this is what World Ocean Days is all about. It's about learning. Everybody as individuals learning new stuff from all different people, but then going out and actioning it and sharing the knowledge and then making changes to help protect our oceans. So let's quickly talk a little bit about actual sharks in terms of their biology and, and what we're actually talking about, the sharks. So sharks are fish, but they vary quite a lot from most of the other fish that we see in the ocean, mainly because they, are cartil they have cartilaginous skeletons, which means that their skeletons are made up of the same material of, that our ears and our, our nose is made up of, so much more flexible, much lighter. And this actually makes them 
more efficient in the water so they can swim uh, with less effort. They're also more flexible so they can turn much faster and many other advantages of having a cartilaginous skeleton where most other fish have a bony skeleton like us, very hard, strong bone. Another thing about sharks is that there are many, many different species of sharks. Now I know I've got some really big shark fans here from seeing the messages and the, and the emails that I've got, which is brilliant. But the vast majority of people would probably only assume there's maybe five, maybe 10 different species of shark, pretty much the sharks you hear about in the news, the scary big ones that are, uh, that are portrayed as these monsters in the news. But in fact, there's over 500 different species of shark in our oceans around the world that we know of. And there's probably plenty of sharks that we don't even, we haven't even discovered yet. There's new sharks being discovered all the time. Even last year, there was a new um, shark discovered, the American pocket shark, only about 30 centimeters long. So it really is, they're vastly uh, varying in their species. There's, like I said, there's huge sharks like the whale shark, there's tiny sharks, there's sharks that live really, really, really deep down in the ocean. Then there's sharks that live right on the surface and sharks that live right near the coast and sharks that live way out to sea. So they're such a varying species. We can't group them up all into one sort of assumption, which is what a lot of people do. The other really interesting fact that is, is important to understand is that sharks have been around for a vastly long time. So they've been in our oceans over 400 million years. Now that's just a number that you, you can't even imagine. And if we try and put that into perspective, sharks were in our oceans 150 million years before the dinosaurs were even around. So before the dinosaurs, which we kind of think as, as you know, some of the oldest animals on earth, sharks were there 150 million years before the dinosaurs were even on land. Sharks were in our oceans before we even had trees on land. So it's really hard to get around in your head, but what you have to think is just sharks have been around in our oceans for a very, very long time. And they have been performing a really important function in our oceans and have been really, really important to the health of our oceans this whole time in 400 million years. And to put that into even more perspective, humans have only really been around on the planet for about 20 to 30,000 years. So sharks, 400 million years, they've been in our oceans as it's changed through mass extinctions, all sorts. We've been around for 20 to 30,000 years, just a blink of an eye compared to how long sharks have been around. But unfortunately, due to human activity, sharks are in a massive decline. So it's, it's well reported that most shark species are in a rapid decline, especially over the last 100 years. And certain shark species, such as the oceanic white tip and the blue sharks, which are some of the bigger sort of top predators, have actually reduced by 99% in the last 100 years alone. Okay, so there's these really, really scary numbers. 99% reduction in the number of sharks in our oceans for certain species in just 100 years. That's just, you know, just over one generation of humans. And we've nearly wiped out certain species, which is really, really scary. So we really need to start working to change these numbers and to, to stop that reduction and hopefully allow sharks to, to regenerate. So sharks are very vulnerable to decline, which is one of the reasons we've seen such a fast reduction in shark numbers. So we'll quickly talk about why are they vulnerable to decline. So sharks are very slow growing and late to mature. So if we compare our sharks, if we sort of talk about them in terms of a top predator, so we look at our lion, compare our lion to our shark. Lions live to around 20 years at sort of a maximum, but they reach sexual maturity at around two to three years old. So after they've reached sexual maturity, obviously, they can reproduce. And if we're talking, when we're talking about population numbers, as long as we allow an animal a chance to reproduce and those babies are allowed to grow up and then reproduce, we can assume that there is, the numbers are relatively stable, okay? So each animal is able to create a new animal. That's how, you know, populations work. So the, the, the lion reaches sexual maturity about two to three years old and then can start reproducing. On the other hand, sharks mature much later. So for example, our whale shark here, they live to over a hundred years. And in fact, the oldest known shark that researchers have, have sort of found was a Greenland shark. So it lives up in the very, very cold Arctic waters around Greenland and Iceland. And it's thought that that shark possibly lived up to 360 years old, 360 years. 
and to to add in maturity in that 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 group or greenland sharks in general are thought that they don't reach sexual maturity until 150 years old so that's like being a teenager for 150 years now i'm sure i'm sure a lot of the kids are thinking that sounds great but i'm sure a lot of the parents are now pulling their hair out at the thought of of having a teenager for 150 years but to to talk about it in population terms sharks take a very long time before they can start to reproduce so if we are fishing them or killing them in the ocean before they've had a chance to reproduce that just means the numbers are going to be declining so this is why they're very vulnerable to decline because because they take so long to rep to get to an age to reproduce if we're taking them out before they have had a chance to do that it's just going to be a declining number and to add on to that they have very few young as well and usually a few years between reproductive cycles so again that means that they don't have lots and lots of babies in one go therefore it gives a good chance for some of those babies to grow up um, to adulthood and then reproduce themselves in fact they have very few young which again means that if we are killing pregnant females or if we're killing pups um, before they've reached so sort of before they've grown up again we're going to have this decline so those factors all added together mean that they are really really vulnerable to decline so it just means we cannot treat them and we cannot fish them out of the oceans like we do with a lot of other fish so we know why sharks are vulnerable to decline now but why does that matter a lot of people if you were to ask them in the street and say you know sharks are about to become extinct how's that going to affect you most people would be like it's not going to affect me i don't go diving with sharks i don't care about sharks i'm going to go on with my life and and i'm not going to be affected by the extinction of sharks at all but in fact it couldn't be more different sharks are what are called keystone species so they play a vital role in the ecosystem so an ecosystem is basically an area where lots of living animals exist and the ecosystem includes all of the living organisms in that so when we talk about an ecosystem for sharks we're talking about under the sea the marine ecosystem so all the life in the sea is part of that marine ecosystem and sharks play a really really important role to keep that ecosystem healthy they do this by maintaining species biodiversity so this means that by actually having sharks in that ecosystem, they allow for lots of different species to survive. If sharks weren't in certain ecosystems, certain species of other fish would, would overpopulate and then remove other species. And therefore we'd actually have a lower biodiversity and therefore a less healthy ecosystem. So sharks being the top predator and hunting lots of different species of fish allow for, for the variety of fish to, to stay nice and high and doesn't allow one species to overpopulate and to sort of take over a whole ecosystem, reducing the biodiversity. They also remove unhealthy and ill and diseased fish from the population, therefore stopping the spread of diseases. So they're really, really important to our oceans. And still, maybe if you're talking to that person on the street and you explain this and they said, okay, well, the oceans can be unhealthy, that doesn't matter to me, I live on land. But in fact, the oceans are, are vitally important to uh, our land and our way of life on land. They provide between 50 to 85% of all the oxygen that we breathe. So as you guys probably heard at the very start of World Oceans Day, every second breath we take comes from the ocean. Also, it stores, the ocean stores 25% of the carbon dioxide that we produce through burning fossil fuels and other carbon emissions and actually stores or absorbs 90% of the heat that we produce from all of these different activities uh, that uh, like I said carbon emissions so without the ocean being healthy it would not be able to do these things and therefore our life on land would be under threat as well because we wouldn't have the same amount of oxygen carbon dioxide levels would be rising very fast so we need a healthy marine ecosystem to, to have a healthy land ecosystem. So we're gonna watch a quick video now, which shows you the importance of, of key predators or keystone species in an ecosystem. This video is about wolves done by Sustainable Human, which is an amazing channel, um, but it's giving you the same idea as what sharks do in the ocean. So let's just watch this now.
One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. But the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the car of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Okay, guys, so hopefully you've got a really good idea there of how important these, these certain species are, these top predators, and that's exactly what sharks are doing in our oceans. But at the moment, they are getting removed at a, a scary, scary rate. So let's look at the main barriers and the biggest problems we have in shark conservation. So the biggest barrier that we have in inside shark conservation and to try and protect sharks and get them, you know, in laws and all sorts of things like that is the fear and misunderstanding that the general public have. Like I said, if you're to walk down the street, walk down your local high street and ask people how they felt about sharks, the vast majority of them would say they're scared of sharks. They don't like sharks. They think sharks are mean monsters, anything like that. And this is because of, the way that sharks are portrayed and how people see sharks in, in general life. And it's this fear and misunderstanding which really stops any sort of protection happening. So, you know, people, the general public see sharks through films and through newspaper articles. That's the majority of the way people see sharks until you start, you know, learning about them and researching them. And so people will see photos like these two here, the 
scary shark with big, big teeth or a film like Jaws, for example. I'm sure a lot of you might be a little too young to have seen short Jaws, but I guarantee you almost all of your parents will have seen Jaws and probably will have been affected by it and probably wouldn't have got back in the ocean for a little while after watching it. And, and this, is the, this is how successful that film was. It did a brilliant, brilliant job. Um, and it was amazing directing and, and producing, but it did an awful job for, for sharks because people became so scared of them. And with this fear that sharks are these deadly, scary animals that are just swimming around the ocean to bite people, we don't have any compassion or any emotion towards these animals. And this is the biggest problem because without the general public having any emotion or compassion to the animals, they won't want to protect them and therefore the governments won't be pushed or won't have any sort of incentive to protect them. So it's, it works in a cycle with, more the, with the population supporting sharks, the governments will support sharks and therefore it'll go around in a circle and more protection will happen as it goes. So we need to try and avoid sort of sharing these, these media um, outlets, you know, films and newspaper articles where they use scare tactics to try and sell newspapers and films, but actually the facts and how the sharks behave is highly inaccurate. Um, we need to try and avoid this and try and drive an emotional connection and a love for sharks to help protect them. Now, another reason that we don't link sharks with emotion, and this goes for all fish, and it's a really interesting fact that I think most people don't even realize, and that is the fact that because fish don't feel pain, we don't really link them, sorry, because fish don't make noise, I need to say that back, because fish don't make any noise, we think that they don't feel any pain. But in fact, they do feel pain, just in the same way as mammals and birds feel pain on land. It's been proven many, many times in many research studies that sharks and fish feel pain very much in the same way that mammals and birds do but yet we don't link them to feeling pain. And if, you know, as an example, if I was to walk around and I stub my toe, obviously I would say, ow. If I was to drop a table on my toe though, I would scream out in pain. So people would know how much pain I'm in by the amount of noise I make. Where fish and sharks just, they don't make any noise. When we pull them out of the ocean, for example, you know, if we just use someone going on a normal fishing trip, they pull a fish on a hook out of the ocean, it's silent. Therefore, you sort of just assume that it's not in pain. If it's not making any noise, then surely it can't be in any pain. But that fish has a hook going through its cheek and it's being held up by this hook. There is no doubt that that fish is feeling pain. It's just that they don't make noise out of water or not sort of audible noise because they're not designed to be out of water. So we really need to start overcoming this, this assumption that fish don't feel pain and really start being more aware that fish do feel pain even though they're not making any noise. And with this increased emotional connection with a fish, because we realize that you know, they feel pain, so they should be protected and they shouldn't be treated like they are, then we'll start to make an emotional link to it. It's like, to use a really, uh, a not very nice example, would be imagine if we had you know, a, a, a puppy or a, a pig or a baby pig you know, held up by a hook on its cheek, it would be making a lot of noise. And so a lot of people, would feel sorry and you know would stop it happening but yet thousands of people around the world hold up a fish you know people post photographs with fish hanging from a hook and, and no one bats an eyelid and that's because we just don't link them to feeling pain but we really need to start building up that that emotional connection with with fish and sharks so how dangerous are sharks in sort of real life and i've had a lot of questions and emails and i'm sure a lot of questions afterwards will be about you know, how deadly are sharks and how dangerous sharks And Actually, in reality, sharks are much less dangerous than most people think, okay? So only about six to 10 people a year around the world are fatally wounded by sharks. And I say fatally wounded because the vast majority of, of shark bites that happen is just an individual bite. It's a, a, a case of mistaken identity. So the shark comes up thinking, that that person is their food source, maybe a seal or a large fish. They bite once, they realize their mistake and they leave. Unfortunately, occasionally this bite is so large that, that the person dies from this, but it only happens to six, on average six, but sometimes up to 10 people a year, which is tiny around the whole world. If we think about 
the hundreds of thousands of people that are in the ocean every year, swimming, snorkeling, diving, surfing, paddleboarding, all these different activities we do in the ocean. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the ocean every single year. And yet very, very few negative interactions happen with sharks. And that is because they just don't see us as food. And, you know, the fact that we go diving, like I said, I've, I've seen hundreds of sharks on, on scuba dives and free dives and never had any sort of negative interaction with them. And that's because they just don't see us as food. If we compare that to a predator on land, like a lion, you would not be able to walk past a pride of lions in the savannah without the risk of being attacked because they do possibly see us as a food source. That's why we always go in, you know, in vehicles and you, you're safe in a vehicle where with sharks, we can swim around with sharks in most situations and there is not a negative interaction there. So they don't see us as food. And in fact, they're generally very cautious and, and generally avoid humans. Like I said, the majority of times that I've seen sharks on my dives, unfortunately for me, they've actually been swimming away from me because they don't want to stick around. They don't know really what we are. We are quite a big animal. They don't know if we're a predator, if we're dangerous to them. And so generally they actually swim away from you if, if they see a person in the water, whether it's on the surface or on a dive, majority of sharks will be swimming away from you and, and actively avoid you because they just don't know what we are. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna watch a really amazing video um, that was shown on Blue Planet Live called The Woman Who Swims With Sharks. Okay, this is an amazing video with Christina Zanato. And it really shows you how sharks actually behave around humans. Now, this is a very unique experience anyway, because she does have food. She has some bait in, in a canister, which is why the sharks are staying around her for longer. Because like I said, most sharks will just move off as soon as they see a human. But because there's some bait in the water, they do stick around because they know there's food somewhere. But I just want you to watch how the sharks behave during this clip and think about how the media portrays sharks and says how there's this man eating shark in, you know, in off the coast of whatever. And then think about how these sharks are actually behaving around Christina and think, you know, are they intelligent? Are they emotional animals? And do they really, are they very picky and very decisive about what they choose to swim towards? And, you know, are they investigating and not just this mindless man eater that's just sort of trying to bite everything in its path? So let's just watch this and really take in how sharks really do behave. Okay, guys, well, I hope all of your faces are like mine whenever I watch that, which is just jaw dropped. Absolutely incredible footage and beautiful to see these amazing sharks interacting with Christina and showing a lot of emotional capacity. You can, you can see these sharks come, they sit down next to her almost, and they seem to enjoy getting a bit of a stroke. So you can see, after watching this video, you can hopefully all of you can answer these questions that are on my slide. You can answer them for yourself. Do they have a chance to bite Christina? Well, yeah, they have a plenty of chances. They're very close to her, but do they? Obviously not. Are they aggressive? Even though there's fish in the water, there's a smell of fish in the water. Are they aggressive towards Christina or anything else? No, they're very calm. They're very inquisitive. Do they make decisions and do they feel emotions? And I hope after watching that video, you can really start to get a better idea of how intelligent sharks are and how they really can behave. And they're not this mindless man eater that, that just comes up from the deep just to bite people's legs, which is how the media and newspapers like to portray them. So what is the current situation? Like I said, right at the start, shark species around the world are rapidly declining, which is extremely worrying and extremely upsetting. And in fact, to put uh, a number on that, even though it's very, very hard to know an exact number because so much of it goes on illegally and way, way out to sea where no one can really count them or measure them, but it's thought that up between 100 and 260 million sharks are killed every year. 100 to 260 million sharks. That is just an an unimaginable number. If we put that in perspective, that's about 10,000 sharks every hour. That means by the end of my talk today, 10,000 more sharks will have died around the world, which is just unacceptable. Okay, so we need to 
work out and talk and discuss and shout out how we can protect sharks and how we can stop these numbers from happening. So what are the main threats from facing sharks? I'm going to go over this relatively quickly because it's World Oceans Day and I want to keep it really, really positive and I want everyone to have really, really great energy coming out of this and for everyone to just want to talk about sharks and be really excited. But we do have to look at the, the reality of what is happening to sharks to keep us motivated and keep us really, really driving to help protect them. So one of the biggest threats to sharks is the shark fin industry. So if anyone doesn't know what shark finning is, it's the act of pulling a shark up onto a boat, cutting its fins off, okay, with a knife. So cutting its top, its dorsal fin off and its pectoral fins that are on the side, and then throwing this shark back in the ocean to drown. Now these sharks, without their fins, they can't swim. So they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they either drown or they bleed to death. So needless to say, this is an unbelievably cruel act and just should not be happening to any animal, but it is happening to hundreds of millions of sharks around the world every year. And this is to supply what is called shark fin soup. You can see the photo in the bottom corner there is shark fin soup. And this is a delicacy served in Asian cuisine, which is served at events like banquets and at weddings. And it's served as a sign of status. So it's the only reason reason people serve shark fin soup is to show how wealthy they are or how important they are at their weddings or at their banquets and so it's it's quite obvious that this is a completely pointless reason to to serve shark fin soup to to, to kill a, a top predator a, an ancient evolved top predator that is vital to our oceans are being killed just to serve a soup just to show off how rich and important people are the shark, the shark fin doesn't add any nutritional value, doesn't add any flavor. They actually add chicken broth or pork broth to the soup, so it tastes nice. And so it's just a completely pointless and wasteful activity and, and reason to, to kill a shark. is just, it's, it's sort of hard to get your head around, but it is happening to hundreds of million sharks around the year. So please, if you do ever see shark fin soup being served in restaurants, then obviously, don't support that restaurant. Even if you want to, you can contact that restaurant, tell them why shark fin soup is so damaging to the environment and what they should be doing. Share the information you've learned today about shark fin soup and, and why it should be stopped. And also, if you see petitions about shark fin soup, about increasing their regulations, then please read them carefully. But then if you agree with them and they will help, then please do sign them and share them so we can start getting better laws on shark fin soup and shark finning industry. But let's talk more about something that's a little bit more close to home, a little bit more directly applicable, directly relatable to all of us sitting at home in, around the UK and possibly other parts around the world today, is the second biggest threat facing sharks and facing the oceans in general, and that is overfishing. So over the last 50 to 100 years, our fishing industry has changed massively and it has industrialized, which means it has got a lot bigger and there is so much more ability to catch so many more fish than there used to be a hundred years ago. The size of the boats are bigger, the size of the nets, the machinery, the engines are stronger so they can pull up bigger nets. They can go further out to sea, go deeper, all these things, which means that the fishing industry, the commercial fishing industry is literally emptying our oceans day by day. They are fishing out more fish than can be um, reproduced in the ocean. So we're taking out more fish than there are re like spreading in the ocean. So therefore the numbers of fish are just declining very, very rapidly around the world. And there's the, the fishing industry is also very destructive. So certain methods destroy whole ecosystems, destroy coral reefs and seabeds and all sorts. And also it's very wasteful. It's thought that around 40% of the global catch so 40% of everything that the fishing industry catches around the world is what's called bycatch, which is basically any animal that is caught that is not the target species. So you can see in that bottom photo there, there's a lot of different species of animal in there. Now, I don't know what species that fishing boat was aiming to catch, but you can see it's caught some sharks in there. It's caught some different sized fish and all those other animals in there that was not the target species is what's called bycatch. And 40% of everything caught around the world 
in commercial fisheries is bycatch, which is just wasted. The majority of that will get thrown back in the ocean already dead or dying, which is just unthinkable. So we're gonna quickly look at two main methods of fishing that are, in my opinion, two of the most damaging. Um, and we then will talk about how we can how we can change this. So first of all, long line fishing is extremely damaging to the bigger species. So sharks, other big predatory fish, swordfish, uh, tuna, dolphins, even turtles, all these other animals that are big, amazing sort of top predators in the ocean are, are very vulnerable to long line fishing as that. And that is the act of letting a line out that can be up to 60 kilometers long with regular hooks with bait on. And these lines are left out for possibly sometimes a few days and anything that comes up and bites that hook or bites that bait is gonna get caught on the line and is likely to die on the line. So this catches many, many sharks, turtles, dolphins, sea lions, even albatross. Albatross are caught on the hooks as they, as they dive in and try and grab the bait. So many, many fish and, and other marine life is killed trying to catch certain species. So long line is often used for, for tuna, for swordfish to catch those, but regularly 40 up to 60% of all the fish that are caught on these lines aren't actually the target species and therefore will die on the line unnecessarily and will probably get thrown back in the ocean. Now the second form of fishing which I want to talk about which is probably the most damaging method of any sort of food collection in the world is bottom trawling. So this is the act of having a huge, huge net. And you can see the top photo there is, is a bottom trawling net, a huge, huge net that gets put down to the bottom of the ocean and then is just dragged along the bottom of the ocean, picking up absolutely everything inside. And all the structures on the bottom of the ocean are just flattened and destroyed. Okay, to put this into context, this is like going over to a forest, having a huge net and some tractors, and then just dragging these tractors in this net through a whole forest just to pick up a few deer that happen to be in the forest. But everything else gets flattened or, or captured and killed unnecessarily. So all the trees and the shrubs, all of that get flattened. All the other life there, hedgehogs, foxes, other deer species, all that sort of stuff will all get killed and trapped in this net just to catch a few deer species. And so Obviously, as I say this, you're probably all thinking, well, that's just ridiculous. That just would not be allowed on land. But that is happening in our oceans around the world every day in vast, vast amounts. But it's still legal. And it's legal because not enough people you know, put their hand up and say this just should not happen. People still buy fish products that are bottom trawled. And therefore, while there's demand, the seafood industry will continue doing it. So we need to try... And, and push that or push the demand and the emphasis away from bottom trawling and long lining and these really, really damaging um, fishing methods. So we're gonna watch a clip now, which summarizes the whole fishing industry and talks a little bit more about these methods of, of fishing as well. So while you're watching this, please start thinking about what is your impact on the ocean by the seafood that you eat. As the demand for seafood increases, along with the fishing power of the global fleet, the question becomes, can the oceans keep up with the hunt? Many of the fish species we depend on are in serious trouble, and the situation is becoming more critical every day. When you look at the oceans, they seem so vast that you think to yourself, how could people possibly fish out the oceans? I mean, the oceans cover much more of the Earth's surface than the land does. But most of the ocean is biologically a desert. The life is there, but it's very, very sparse. And where it's concentrated happens to be along the continents. Few people realize the scale of the world's fishing effort and what the industry must do to supply the ever-growing demand for seafood. But even in the most remote locations and in the deep waters of the open ocean, fish populations are being exhausted, one after another by vessels using space-age tracking technology, dragging nets that sweep vast areas of ocean floor, and deploying miles and miles of baited hooks. The rate at which fish stocks are collapsing today is unprecedented, and the forces that give rise to this crisis are complex. Simply put, the fish cannot reproduce quickly enough 
to keep up with an ever-intensifying hunt, feeding an ever-growing human population. Each year, over 20 million metric tons of untargeted marine life, so-called bycatch, are discarded as waste, a volume equal to four times the entire catch of the U.S. fishing fleet. The amount of bycatch differs with each type of fishery, but among the worst are shrimp trawls. The mouth of the net is spread by the action of two heavy steel plates that drag along the bottom at either side. Vast areas of seafloor formerly inaccessible to fishing are now being trawled. We've seen in areas that are chronically impacted by hundreds and hundreds of boats dragging nets and dredges all over the continental shelf that a large percentage of the animals that make up the structures on the seafloor. Today's long liners often deploy up to 60 miles of baited hooks. Thousands of these vessels now fish the world's oceans, landing millions of tons of tuna and swordfish every year. Sea turtles, considered endangered species worldwide, also fall victim to long line hooks. The long-term effects of this massive effort are beginning to show. Marine ecosystems, millions of years in the making, are being altered in ways that have never been seen. I think fisheries and ocean ecosystems are in much greater trouble than is commonly appreciated. If we act in the relatively near future, we can turn some of those things around. It really is very much up to us to decide people shape the world. We can choose. There's a lot of potential to bring things back and have abundance and have beauty. And there's also a lot of risk right now. We are at a crossroads. Whether or not we meet the challenges we face depends not only on fishermen and policymakers, but on each and every one of us, both as citizens and consumers. Okay, guys, so that's uh, just some clips from a documentary called Empty Oceans, Empty Nets. Really, really interesting. It's getting a little bit old now, but it's still great to, you know, if you really want to learn more about the fishing industry and, and the health of the oceans, it's a good, you know, full-length documentary watch. There's obviously plenty more that are, that are a bit more updated that, that give you a really good idea of, of what's happening in the, in the world today in terms of sort of fishing industry and the health of our oceans. So... Let's sort of really move on. Like I said, I really want to make this positive energy and really sort of a more positive talk, not concentrating on the negatives, but how we can change and what we can do to help the oceans. So how can you help? First thing you can do is, is learn more about sharks. Continue to learn because the more we learn, the more you understand animals and therefore the more you love animals and therefore you, the more you want to protect animals. So continue to learn about sharks um, through documentaries, through books, through TV programs, courses, online courses, there's loads. I am gonna continue doing shark talks. So you know, follow my social media pages to find out when the next talk's gonna be and I'll continue teaching everyone about sharks so you can learn more, but just continue to learn about sharks and we can really start to overcome this fear that everyone has. And to, to sort of jump onto the next one is, we need to stop that fear and misinformation that the vast majority of people still have. So please, Spread the knowledge that you've learned today. Tell friends, tell family, tell all your other kids at school if they didn't watch this, what you learned about sharks and how amazing they are and how they're not these scary, dangerous animals that, that a lot of people think they are. And really try and spread that love and that understanding of sharks instead of spreading fear and misinformation. And then finally, consider the impact of the seafood that you eat. So as you've seen from the last video, the seafood that we put on our plate often has uh, an impact on the ocean. So we need to really start being more aware of, of what has happened to get the food onto our plates. How has it been caught? Where has it been caught? Has it had a negative impact on the environment? So using, well, to, to reduce your impact on the ocean, the most you can then i would say stop eating fish at all because that will completely eradicate your negative impact of fishing industries if you do want to continue eating seafood that's fine what i would say is like i said you just need to start learning and finding out 
where and how your seafood is caught. So using something like the MCS Good Fish Guide, there's a little photo down there, little pocket size guide. You can also download an app, which is great. Just like uh, search Good Fish Guide, you'll find loads of resources. And then you can start looking into what fish you're about to buy or what fish you're about to order at a restaurant. And you can find out if that fish species is a healthy fish species. And also you can then start asking how it's caught. So in supermarkets, you should be able to find on the packaging how it's caught, if it's bottom trawled, if it's long lined, if it's per sign net, some of that, all of them can be quite damaging. So we want to try and avoid them. Ideally, we want to look for <clears throat> rod and line. Um, rod and line caught is the best way, best method, because that is literally going back to our roots of literally one line and uh, one hook. So therefore it really minimizes bycatch. I don't have time to go into fish farming because in some ways farmed fish is, is as bad as wild caught um, sometimes. Like I said, I don't, just don't have time to go into it today. Another one of my talks in a few weeks time will be on farmed fish and more information about um, the fishing industry. So please tune into that if you want to learn more. Um, but for today, just start using the Good Fish Guide to try and reduce your seafood intake as well. And we can start having less of a negative impact on the, the environment. So thank you so much for everyone coming. I'll just summarize quickly. Like I said at the start, what do I want everyone to get from this? So sharks are essential to the ecosystem. Hopefully everyone understands that now. They are misunderstood species and they are a massive risk of extinction and they need our help. They need everyone and as many people as possible to start getting behind them, start supporting them to, to start getting more protection. And you as an individual can make a difference. Like I said, every one of you who's watching today, if you all go out and tell 10 people about what you've learned today, that'll be now 5,000 people that know more about sharks. And then if those people tell 10 people, then it's 50,000. So it just grows. So we need to share the knowledge you as an individual can make a difference if you just act and make actions happen right now. So thank you so much for everyone joining on my talk. I really hope you enjoyed um, my talk for World Oceans Day to Day. What I'll do is I'll open up the chat now um, so people can post some questions. Like I said, I won't, um, I won't be able to answer many of them because I've already got a list of questions here that I'm gonna answer. Um, just finally, before I get onto the questions, just this last page, which I'm gonna leave up. So please, if you want to learn more about sharks and the marine environment, then follow me uh, at Ginger Under the Sea Talks on Facebook and Ginger Under the Sea on Instagram. Also follow Eco Action Families, who has kindly sort of hosted this. And I, I'm partnered with Eco Action Families doing their talks and, organize, and helping um, get some marine environment stuff going there. So please follow both of them. On, on Instagram and Facebook to continue, keep up with what we're doing and how you can continue helping. There's loads of really, really great resources on both of those sites. Um, I know there's a lot of kids here. There might be some teachers and some parents here. I do do talks to schools. So if you think your school or your children's school could benefit from having this talk, then please get in contact with me uh, via email or via any of those methods and I can organize and we can do a zoom call or once lockdown is all over i can come and visit schools so please do get in contact if you think your school can benefit from the talk and then we have some really interesting resources down there uh, of websites to visit to learn more and to learn more about seafood and then finally so guys i am going to be doing a talk next wednesday on my on my own um account ginger under the sea um called shark facts and diving so that's going to cover a lot more about shark biology and how sharks grow up and how they reproduce and all sort of really, really, really interesting facts um, and a bit of my experiences with diving with sharks as well. So please follow, um, follow me and find out when that is. What I'm gonna 